Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence's Write and Tell series. My name is Miriam Durrani. I'm the Vice President of Policy at the National Domestic Violence Hotline, and it is my absolute privilege to serve as a liaison to the Commission. The Commission is nearing its 29th year working towards its mission of increasing access to justice for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and stalking by mobilizing the legal profession. The Commission provides free training and support to legal system actors working with survivors of gender-based violence. The Write and Tell series was created because the Commission knows the power of storytelling for individual and collective healing, effective litigation outcomes, and the promotion of policy change. With that power comes great responsibility of telling the stories of others and creating space for survivors to share their own stories. So today is our third event in our series, and we wanted to thank our series co-sponsors, the Commission on Women in the Profession, and today's ABA co-sponsors, the Family Law Section, Section on Civil Rights and Social Justice, Commission on Homelessness and Poverty, Criminal Justice Section, the Standing Committee on Legal Aid and Indigent Defense, Standing Committee on Pro Bono and Public Service, and the Young Lawyers Division. So today, I'm really excited to be joined by pioneer and author, Dr. Judith Herman. Judith Herman, uh, MD, is a professor of psychiatry, part-time, at Harvard Medical School for 30 years until she retired. She was the director of training at the Victims of Violence Program at the Cambridge Hospital in Cambridge, Massachusetts. She is the author of the award-winning books, Father Daughter Incest and Trauma and Recovery. She is recipient of numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1984 and the 1996 Lifetime Achievement Award from the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies. In 2007, she was named a Distinguished Life Fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Her new book, Truth and Repair, How Trauma Survivors Envision Justice, was published in March 2023. So that all being said, it is a great privilege to have Dr. Herman here. Also, please be sure to post any questions, comments, anything that comes up for you in the chat. They actually are going to be monitored during the duration of this stream and um, everyone supporting us from posting them as they come in. So Dr. Herman, let's dive in. I know in your new book, Truth and Repair, how Trauma Survivors Envisage Justice, you build upon the stages of recovery uh, that you addressed in your 1992 book, Trauma and Recovery. So I hope everyone has read your previous book and they're gonna read your new one, but could you start by giving us just a little bit of an overview of the stages and what you think everyone should know about trauma? Okay, thank you uh, for having me here with you. Um, uh, my idea about stages of recovery um, is really kind of a, a, an outline or a sketch. It's not meant to be taken too literally, and it's not as though people march through these stages in any kind of time, a rigid timetable or sequence. But um, I viewed the first stage of recovery from trauma as uh, focused on safety. And the reason for that is that if you're not safe in the present, you don't have post-traumatic stress disorder. You, you, the trauma is still ongoing, or at least you're, un, you're under constant threat. You're not really uh, in a position to heal. Uh, so I safety is really stage one and that's true whether you're talking about sexual and domestic violence whether you're talking about war war trauma um as long as you're still under attack uh you're really not in a position to heal and that's why we evacuate wounded people from the front lines uh in wars uh, the front lines in gender violence is often the home. Um, so safety often involves uh, the kind of crisis intervention that was pioneered by the women's movement in terms of refuges for um, 
uh, for women and kids and in terms of legal protections. So it's a, it's a complicated social project to create safety. Nobody can be safe alone. Um, and um, uh, once that's established, then one can begin to come to terms with the past in a way that says, that was then, this is now. I went through something terrible, but it's over. Um, and at that point, uh, then people can do the kind of work that kind of focuses more on the traumatic experience, both sort of coming to terms with the memory of what happened and grieving what was lost. Um, so that's really the second stage, the more trauma focused part of recovery. And then um, people often think that that's going to go on forever, that they're just going to keep grieving forever. Um, but it, in fact, uh, at a certain point, and there's no, you know, no one size fits all timetable for this. Um, but at a certain point, people start thinking, you know what? Um, I am more than my trauma. I am, uh, my life was, has been irrevocably changed by what happened to me, but it's not totally defined by that. And maybe, you know, the past doesn't determine the future. And so people can come back to the present, this time in a less defensive way and a more proactive way saying, you know, but maybe I have a future and maybe I can take, even take some risks and maybe I've learned something and maybe I have something to contribute to the world because of what I've learned. Um, uh, and so, uh, and it, it's become clear now that there's a, a group of survivors who develop what's called a survivor mission. This was a, a term first coined by my colleague, Robert J. Lifton, who studied the Hiroshima atomic bomb survivors, uh, who saw their city completely destroyed and who said, maybe the only reason I'm, I, I can find for having survived is to tell the world what happened and to try to prevent this from happening again. Um, and so, and then it turns out that people who develop that kind of survivor mission of wanting to um, make their, their suffering in some ways and their their, what they've learned from it, a gift to others, and join with others to try to make a better world, they do well. Um, so that's the three stages in, in a nutshell. And, and, and this new book, Truth and Repair, which is really kind of a sequel to Trauma and Recovery, kind of picks up where that left off and says, well, maybe there's a fourth stage. And maybe that has to do with justice. Um, because if trauma is indeed a social problem, not just an individual misfortune, then individual healing may be necessary, but not sufficient. And maybe we need social solutions. If it is in, if it results from an injustice, then is justice part of healing? And so that's what this book, new book, is about. I appreciate that so much. I mean, I think you did such a fantastic job of tackling the question. Um, just thinking about the book, you know, at the end of part one, 
you talk about impunity and the systems that allow harm. And I think that really resonates with me as an advocate, as a lawyer, as someone who works in these systems. So there's been so much progress made on the whole field of abuse and violence, but there's still so many gaps. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on why you think these gaps still persist. Well, when we're talking about violence against women, um, which is what I, 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 I took this as the sort of archetype, if you will, of deeply culturally embedded systems of dominance and subordination. We're, when we're talking about patriarchy, we're talking about a worldwide system that has persisted for millennia. Um, and the violence, that, like any system of dominance and subordination, whether you're talking about race, caste, class, or gender, um, or religion. Um, ultimately, it's enforced by violence. Um, because most people don't like being controlled by other people. And they will tend to resist. So at a certain point, you've got to use force if you want to exert control. But in systems that are deeply part of cultural traditions, the violence is often hidden, or if it's seen, it's rationalized, it's excused, it's justified, it's um, uh, she asked for it, basically. Um, and, um, and, and so you are talking about an, um, not only uh, changing relationships of power, but changing all the cultural institutions that support so that those systems of dominance and subordination. So, there's a reason why um, Juliet Mitchell called women's liberation the longest revolution. Um, and, um, you know, we've seen quite a bit of progress and also backlash and regress in, you know, the, the 50, 60 years that I've been uh, aware of all this. Um, but in the grand scheme of history, that's kind of blink of an eye. I, know, I think it just adds so much context thinking about all the systems of power. So, you know, there's so much more work to be done. <laughs> but thinking about part two, which is where I want to spend a lot of our conversation, you talk about visions of justice. I think, I hope that that's going to appeal to all the legal minds listening in. I just, uh, I love the way that you framed acknowledgement, apology, and accountability. So I just want to start with overcoming the challenge of denial, silence, and stigma. We know that's a significant aspect of dealing with trauma and then also seeking justice. So from your perspective, how can we work to break down these barriers effectively? Well, this is where we all need each other. I, I, nobody can do this alone. And, but, um, but a lot of the enforcement of dominance and subordination is carried out not by means of force, but by means of shame, which turned, I mean, shame is a very powerful social force. Um, and so one of the, besides violence, one of the most powerful methods of course of control is isolation of victims, shaming and isolation of victims so that, so that nobody will believe you, no, it's all your fault, you asked for it. Um, uh, 
And anyway, it's over. So why are you whining about this now? Um, and, and all of those arguments tend to silence and isolate victims. So that's why we need each other. The minute um, survivors start talking amongst themselves, the barriers of shame come down and the barriers of isolation come down. And once people feel that rather than being ostracized and blamed, they're going to be accepted and welcomed. Um, uh, healing begins and people start gaining courage. Um, that's why groups, were, I mean, that's why consciousness raising groups were always such a powerful tool in the women's movement. Um, and that's why therapy groups are such a powerful tool in trauma and recovery because when they, they form, a, if you will, a, a kind of an alternative community to the, uh, the wider community in which the dominance and subordinate relations of men and women are acceptable. And all of a sudden people are respected, they're honored, and they also can feel pride in the sense that they have something to give to one another as well as receiving help from one another. And so that's why grassroots organizing is, is always key, I think. You're appealing to my grassroots organizing heart. <laughs> no, I mean, I think we know the power in storytelling. And again, I'm probably going to do this like 17 times, but it's another plug for your book. I found the stories that you shared from survivors to be so powerful, to be so moving um, and so effective. You know, we always try to share things from you know, the ceiling level or the macro level and just those stories have power. So I appreciate that so much. Um, but I know when you talk about acknowledgement, you say the first precept of survivor's justice is the desire for community acknowledgement that a wrong has been done. So I know you mentioned that in the beginning in terms of, you know, what justice looks like for the community, how we all have a role to play. But can you say more about what acknowledgement does for survivors and why it's important? Well, just building on what we've talked about already, I, it, it breaks down that isolation. Um, it, as long as people have to keep what happened to them a secret, um, they feel invisible, unknown. Um, and once the truth of what happened to them is recognized, um, then people can start to feel part of a community, can feel understood, can feel valued and respected. Um, and that's why in some ways the confession of the perpetrator may or not, may not matter at all. He may continue in his denial, but if the community recognizes the truth of what happened, that's more important, uh, to the survivor. And that came out very clearly. I interviewed 30 survivors of sexual, of gender violence of various sorts. Um, uh, child, child sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual trafficking, sexual harassment, domestic violence, 26 women and four men. And every one of them said, the first thing is I want people to know and recognize and believe that this is what happened to me. And not only the facts of what happened, but that it was harmful, because that's always the backup. Yeah, well, so what's the big deal? 
um, why she's such a, a wimp, a wuss, you know. Um, and uh, and that it was wrong. So that, and, and, and they wanted that from the wider community or from the people who mattered to them, from their families, from the people who they cared about. Super, super needed. Following up on that, I know you talk about apology. Um, I know apologies are complicated since we're talking about the legal context and they implicate liability and incrimination, all that stuff. But we know they're an important part to recovery. So why do you think that genuine apologies are so challenging? Well, um, I think in, in, in with a genuine apology, which includes not just an acknowledgement of the facts and acknowledgement of the harm, acknowledgement that it was wrong, but also an expression of remorse and wish to make amends. The power dynamic is reversed. The, the perpetrator puts himself in a position of um, seeking something that the victim it can choose to give or not grant. Um, uh, and um, and so and and so it's an invitation to it's also an invitation to to repair a relationship. And again, I found that I mean there was not unanimity among the people I interviewed on this question. Some people said, "I don't want an apology. I just I, I don't want to see this person again," you know. And I would never trust that any apology from him would be genuine anyway. Um, but, um, but many people did want apologies from the bystanders. They, the, you know, um, the people who might have intervened and the, who could have known or should have known and looked the other way. So with incest survivors, what you keep hearing is, where was my mother? And oftentimes when they seek to repair a relationship, that's the relationship they want to repair. That's the person they want to hear. About. I mean, and that's also true on the scale of world atrocities. I mean, when you talk about the Nazi Holocaust, survivors keep saying, where was the world? You know. Uh, and so, um, so when there's a genuine apology and genuine effort to make amends, it can really restore this person's faith in other people. By contrast, though, uh, you know, phony apologies just make the situation 10 times worse. I mean, it's like adding insult to injury. Um, it is adding insult to injury. And that's why a lot of people just didn't even want to go there. That makes total sense. Yeah. You know, in all of this, I think that you did a really good job of showing how formal structures of justice that we have, that we offer, don't offer survivors the justice that they're often looking for, right? It may work for some people, but it seems like for most individuals, it's not. So I would love for you to share more about how you feel like the legal system is letting survivors down and, and what survivors shared about you know being let down in that process. Well, in terms of accountability, when it comes to gender violence, 
it's just just doesn't happen. I mean, for even in the traditional terms of the criminal justice system, I mean, these are violent crimes. Um, and supposedly something like sexual assault is a felony. It's a serious crime. But in fact, because of all the shaming and isolation and uh, that survivors encounter, the majority never report to law enforcement. Um, I mean, top estimates are right around 30%, you know, and those I think are high, highball estimates. Um, because, um, you know, most sexual assaults are not stranger assaults. They're assaults by acquaintances, by, um, they take place on dates. Uh, they take place at the workplace. Uh, they're people that the victim knows. And so the first question is always going to be, how many drinks did you have? And why did you go to that party? And what were you wearing? And, uh, and why did you lead him on? And uh, why did you get in the car with him? Uh, and so the, the victims are going to be treated more like suspects than, you know. So, so start with a 30% uh, reporting rate, and then cases cleared by arrest, cases accepted for prosecution. I remember the, like, I don't need to tell you this, but the victim has no say in whether, and the prosecutor may say, well, it's a he said, she said, you know, um, I'm not going to, you know, I may not win this case. Um, uh, she wasn't a virgin, you know, uh, or even she dated this guy in the past. Uh, one of the people I interviewed for the book had been engaged to this guy practically, but they broke up and then he broke into her house and raped her at knife point. Um, but um, and in that case, actually, the justice system functioned as it should, uh, and he was convicted. But cases cleared by arrest, accepted for prosecution, resulting in either a conviction or a guilty plea, you're down below 5%, probably down around 1%. Um, so that means the odds of impunity for sexual assault are 95%. Um, and, you know, the only cases that are really vigorously pursued are those extremely rare, unusual cases where it's a young, blonde, white woman and a black stranger who's the assailant. Then the, you know, the justice system will go all out. But uh, otherwise, no. So, um, sorry, I, I live on a street with a lot of fire trucks and ambulances. Um, so if you have 95% impunity, and that's for simple sexual assault. When you get into, you know, something like child abuse, forget about it. I mean, uh, so even in its own terms, the conventional legal system just doesn't deliver. Yeah, I think it's so challenging. And I mean, I think accountability was my favorite chapter uh, because like 
you grapple with all of those pieces. But I also just think personally, working in the anti-violence space, we're constantly grappling with, you know, what accountability looks like and the tools there are and the tools we want to create. Um, but I'd love to just know more about what surprised you the most as you thought about accountability. Good question. Um, I guess one of the things that surprised me or intrigued me was that survivors really made a, an important distinction between accountability and punishment. They really weren't big on punishment, by and large. They really didn't see what good that was going to, punishing the perpetrator was going to do for them. And they wanted justice to be centered on them and to and secondarily to the wider community. So what they wanted, what I think the way they, I'm not sure they used exactly this language, but what they wanted was limit setting. They wanted the community to step up and do whatever it would take to make sure this guy didn't do it again and couldn't do it again. And they didn't necessarily know what that was. And the truth is we don't know what that is because, because we've been so reliant on prison as the metric of punishment. We don't really know what to do with perpetrators. Um, I mean, if you lock them up, uh, they'll get out after a while and uh, nothing will necessarily have changed except maybe they will have become more hardened in their attitudes and their hatreds. Um, and uh, so we know nothing about rehabilitation and we or very, very little. And we know um, and when we really haven't sort of figured out how to place good social controls on this kind of behavior, short of complete sequestration of people from the community, which you know, that's not going to happen. You're not going to lock up if, you know, between five and 10% of the male population, which is our best estimate, uh, engages in sexual assault or has done, you're not going to lock up that, you know, that percentage of the population, nor should you. But then what are you going to do? I think that's the million dollar question, I guess billion dollar question these days. But um, Dr. Herman, we have a question from the audience, which is so perfect. Um, also, you cover this in your book, but since we have you live, <laughs> do you think that restorative justice can work in the gender-based violence context? Very controversial question that is being debated and studied um, in many places. Um, the, the pro argument is that if it worked well, it would offer something much closer to what survivors say they want, which is truth and repair. Um, and for those not familiar with restorative justice concepts, the main, I, the, theoretically, the main idea is that justice should 
be focused on repairing the harms done by the crime rather than punishing the perpetrator. Um, there is no fact-finding mechanism in restorative justice. It requires, so it requires a victim who's willing to, to participate, or they don't say victim, they say harmed person, a perpetrator or harm doer who is willing to acknowledge the harm he's done and apologize and make amends. And then you have a, a, a community meeting, often with a lot of preparation, uh, in which uh, the victim makes basically an impact statement and says what he or she wants for repair. The perpetrator acknowledges and apologizes and expresses willingness to make amends. And then they, they, they together with the community figure out what that repair plan is going to be, what is going to constitute that repair plan. And it's, but then it's up to the community to monitor um, to see whether in fact that is implemented. Um, and uh, so the community basically fulfills the role of judge uh, and uh, jury and probation officer. <laughs> Um, uh, now, uh, where this kind of thing has been implemented most um, effectively with good outcome data, uh, it's uh, in Australia, New Zealand, Canada, um, a lot of it has been for nonviolent juvenile crime. Things like robberies or vandalism where no one was physically harmed, but there's, there's community agreement that both that this is serious, it needs to be taken seriously, it is a problem. There needs to be an intervention. And that this young person might deserve a chance to, you know, not fully morally developed and might need a, you know, deserve a chance to um, do better, make amends. Um, when you, when it comes to gender violence, you don't have that community consensus. Um, you have a lot of division in the community, um, about a, how serious this is, who's to blame, what the consequences should be. Um, so, um, it's not clear that um, uh, I, I mean, I think that the jury is out, so to speak. Um, and there is, and, and particularly with things like domestic violence, many people caution that um, apology is just one of the manipulation techniques of betters, you know? And, and if, uh, I mean, a steady diet of punishment, we know this from rat and pigeon psychology, doesn't work nearly as well in controlling behavior as punishment with a few intermittently spursed, interspersed rewards. Um, and so after each beating, 
sometimes there's this honeymoon period where he, he's so sorry, it'll never happen again. He brings flowers, you know. Um, he, and it may seem very sincere. What isn't spoken is, no, it'll never happen again. If you obey me without not even having to tell you what I want. Um, <laughs> I mean, the, uh, uh, and so she, the, the victim may be manipulated into staying in the relationship based on the hope that, you know, whatever attracted them to each other in the first place is still alive and um, and maybe he really means it this time and maybe it really won't happen again. Um, uh, but it does happen again. Um, that's part of the pattern. So, um, so I think feminists have been rightly cautious about applying restorative justice principles in these situations because they think it's only too easy for perpetrators to just manipulate um, their, uh, the community as well as the victims. It's a complicated and enormous question. Um, I think it's an exciting body of work and I, I'm really curious and cautiously excited about, you know, what comes out of it as, as people are really starting to implement the practice. I think um, there's already some really exciting stories and of course some cautionary tales, but just really look forward to seeing, um, you know, where the entire practice of restorative justice takes us. I think, you know, thinking about creative solutions is, is always, um, such an exciting idea where we are offered, you know, so many straightforward kind of often punitive solutions. So thinking about that. Oh, I, I was just. Oh, yes. Um, one place where um, I think people are doing a lot of experimenting with this is on college campuses. Mm. Um, and, uh, but even there, I think the people who are experienced with it are saying, um, yes, it's very promising and there are some cases that really fit beautifully. And after all, you can say, you know, um, college students are basically teenagers. Their um, they're, they're frontal lobes are not fully developed. Um, you know, they, uh, things like understanding consequences of actions or the impact of your behavior on other people <laughs> or seeing another person's point of view, all those, you know, empathy, though all those good moral qualities are still very much in development, you know, so why not use this as a teachable moment, you know? Um, and because, and most survivors don't really, I mean, if you expel the guy, he'll just go somewhere else and do it again, somewhere else. Um, but even there, a lot of them are saying there's no one size fits all. And, you know, so if, uh, you know, this might be a great teachable moment, uh, not only for the perpetrator, but for all his frat brothers, um, you know, or his sports team. Um, but, you know, if this was premeditated, if he, there's more than one victim, if violence was involved, you know, physical violence was involved, um, maybe not, you know, if it was more of a, you know, they were both drunk and, you know, she, she seemed interested, but then she passed out, but then he did it anyway. You know, technically that, yes, that is sexual assault. Um, but it might be in a different category from the guy who actually spiked the punch and, you know, in the fraternity that set aside rooms so that, you know, and then 
invited all these naive freshmen, you know, and sell it and took videos. I mean, you know, then that might not be, uh, they might not be candidates for restorative justice. Absolutely. Um, and I just want to encourage our audience members to keep putting your questions or comments in the chat. Otherwise, I am just going to keep picking Dr. Herman's brain until the very end, but I want to be able to ask her anything that comes up for you. Um, ooh, a great question, thinking about restorative justice and faith-based contacts. So we have a question or a comment from Joan. Her synagogue is working on restorative justice. For individuals who are sexually exploited when teenagers, do you know of any such processes in the context of religious institutions? I don't offhand, but again, I think um, this would be a promising context in um, in the sense that a whole community wants to reckon with the crimes that they have implicitly condoned. And so if you have good leadership, um, uh, and you have a community that is ready to acknowledge that this kind of thing goes on and that um, abuse, you know, that, that, that shaming and ostracizing and silencing victims has not worked. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and that amends need to be made then I think you might have, um, you know, the, enough of a kind of community consensus so that you could use restorative principles. Um, without that though, I don't know. I mean, and what comes to mind actually, it, um, I've recently had a, a, a been in a, dialogue with a, an ultra-Orthodox rabbi from Brooklyn. Um, and he has, he, he read trauma and recovery in social work school. And one of his big motivations for getting a social work degree was discovering that many of the people in his temple confided in him that they had actually been abused by other rabbis when they were kids. Um, and he was horrified. Um, but he is now walking a very fine line because he's learning. Uh, I mean, he has kind of sought out information very much outside of his um, comfort zone. Uh, I mean, we, it's been very interesting for me because, you know, he's asked, you know, well, what's going on with offenders and how, how do we understand them? And I would say, I, I will say, well, you know, we don't have very much data. And just even that way of that kind of scientific way of answering a question is totally, you know, if, if within the rabbinate, you consult the Torah, you know? <laughs> um, so, um, so he's trying to figure out how he can help his, the people in his temple without being too outspoken and getting sort of ostracized himself. Um, and um, I think in a situation like that, you probably couldn't do it. 
Absolutely. Yeah. I think you need those ripe conditions for change and accountability also. I know that we're winding down, Dr. Herman, and we've talked a lot about um, not only today that we all have a part to play, but you and I had a conversation before this and we talked about, you know, how social services and mental health professionals and caseworkers and lawyers and and that legal professionals, we all have something to do and we have to work together to address violence and trauma effectively. So I just want to know from you, what does that ecosystem of support look like for a survivor? What is the, the ecosystem of support? What does everyone working together look like for you? Oh, it could take so many different forms, but um, and, and I looked at a couple of them in my, in my book that I, I mean, I think it's all so much a work in progress, you know, but um, I mean, the initiative can come from within the legal system. I, I mean, I think what you need is a lot of cooperation between these different silos that think so differently, you know. Um, I mean, cops like to say, we're not social workers. And, um, social workers say, we're not cops. and. Um, uh, and, you know, um, and then you have lawyers and they the, have a, a, a different mindset from either and, um, and judges. But the initiative can come from anywhere that's going to end up with that, having to engage all of those kinds of service because nobody's got the answer by themselves. Um, and so it involves a lot of just, again, community organizing. And um, and I, I, one of the people I interviewed for the book is a um, wonderful judge in Queens named Fernanda Camacho who started a prostitution diversion court because he kind of discovered that Oh my God! These these women are children. They're, you know, they're they're if they're lucky. They're teenagers, you know, um, and their parents tell them to say they're eighteen, but maybe they're fourteen, you know. Um, and um, he's he had been. Uh, a prosecutor before he became a, a, a municipal judge. Um, he said that he asked people to start diverting uh, the these w young women that they arrested to his court. And they all thought, you know, he was kind of, they laughed at him. That don't you, I mean, they thought he was sort of a sucker. You know, don't you know, these are bad girls. And, made bad choices. Um, but so he borrowed a, a social worker from a drug diversion court. And of course, a lot of these kids were on drugs and as well. I mean, uh, uh, and he partnered with a grassroots self-help organization called GEMS um, for Girls in the Life, and also with the Rape Crisis Center at um, one of the New York hospitals. Um, and he built this incredibly successful model um, uh, in which uh, basically, uh, the girls are sentenced to, um, instead of 30 days in jail, 30 days in a refuge. You know? um, and um, it's, it's, and so now he goes and testifies to the legislature. And, um, his model has been replicated in a lot of other jurisdictions. Um, 
But it's that kind of inventiveness, I think, that um, creates the kind of recovery environment that survivors need that includes legal protection, but also all the social services that people need to rebuild a life. And I feel like it was so rewarding for him too, because he got to see, you know, survivors come back to him and share their successes and where they were. So he directly saw the effects of his change, which was really exciting. Wonderful. Um, I did quote him in the book. I said, he said, he described this young woman who had been before him like several times um, and before finally the nickel dropped and he said, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to do this. Again. I'm not going to just put her in jail again. I'm going to do something else. And eventually she would come back to him and say, hey, judge, you know, I got my GED. Hey, judge, I got my driver's license. Hey, judge, I got a job. And um, so people said, well, you saved her life. He said, well, who do you think needed um, was more in need of saving a 15-year-old runaway um, who um, was being exploited or a 45-year-old judge who had been complicit in um, the the revolving door of sexual trafficking. He didn't use exactly those words, but that was the sense of it. It shows that it could just take yeah. one person. But Dr. Herman, I know we're nearing the end of our time. I want to try to squeeze in two questions really quickly. So something that came up when I was talking to a colleague last week was a really interesting point. So, so many lawyers, and advocates, and professionals doing this work are actually survivors of trauma themselves or may experience trauma during their work um, or life or anything that happens. So I just want to show what advice you have for us and them and everyone as we navigate our own repair and also do this work. Um, I say this to therapists too. Don't do it alone. Find your support system, find your buddies, find your sisterhood. Um, you know, you need a shoulder to cry on. You're, you're bearing witness to the horrible things that people do. So you need inspiration. You need to surround yourself with people who, you know, bring out the best. And um, so, I mean, that's what's kept me going all these years is having my my wonderful colleagues and, and we, you know, we cry on each other's shoulders and we laugh together and we party together and, and you know, we sing and make fools of ourselves and, um, you know, uh, that's, I, I think that applies pretty universally. I think that's the perfect note to wrap on, Dr. Herman. Just, I know your work has been so pivotal to understanding of trauma. Are there any, you know, changes or transformations that you hope to see people take based, you know, as they leverage your work, anything, any takeaways you want to offer as we wrap up? Um, any last points? <laughs> How much time do you have? I mean... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, a better world for all of us. It's my, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with a, a pearl from my mother. My mother was a psychologist and a, an activist and, uh, and the, what she said was, activism is the antidote to despair. So um, that's probably a good thing to keep in mind. Absolutely. And thank you again to Dr. Herman for taking the time to share your wisdom and to share all of your pearls of knowledge. I really hope everyone picks up a copy of your book. I had the chance to read it. I 
cried, I healed, I learned. Um, it was very important and, and a really great piece of work for my work. And I think a lot of folks out there, as you understand trauma, as you navigate healing and justice accountability. Also, if you enjoyed this programming, please consider donating to the commission. They do great work. I can testify to that as a liaison and who have lots of excellent coworkers on the commission who are absolute gems to work with. The QR uh, code and link are now on your screen. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, whether you're alive today or listening to us in the future. I hope you learned something uh, and enjoy this fantastic conversation. So appreciate you again, Dr. Herman. Appreciate the commission and appreciate everyone listening in. Thank you very much for having me. Of course. Take care.